Welcome and thank you for joining me today. We are working our way again through various passages of Holy Scripture that are indicative and point us to the significance of the incarnation of Christ, the coming of Jesus to take on human flesh, not only uh, for our salvation, but for the glory of God, to fulfill the, the justice and the holiness of God. Today we are going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 1. We'll look at verses 1 through 4. But to begin, please uh, join me in prayer. God, we thank you for this uh, Christmas season and the, the extended time that we have throughout Advent to give time to think and to pray, to seek, to ponder the significance, the importance, the, the, the power and the glory of you coming and taking on flesh for us and for our salvation. I pray that you'd speak, Lord, to us through your word by the Holy Spirit now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 1. Verses 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now that sounds complicated it sounds uh, rich and deep and, and significant, and, and it, it is. It's complicated. It's, it, it's all of that. But if we boil it down to the simplicity of what the writer of Hebrews is aiming at, he's saying that Jesus Christ is absolutely sufficient for the glory of God and for the rescue of us. From our sins. Jesus is uniquely sufficient, qualified, and enough. And, and so the writer of Hebrews starts out and saying, Long ago, God spoke through the prophets. God inspired them, gave them messages, they proclaimed them, and these prophetic utterances were designed to not reveal the future, just like kind of reading tea leaves, but, but to announce in advance what God was about to do. But now the announcement is no longer what God is about to do. It's an announcement of what God is doing, and that announcement is no longer through merely spoken word, but through an embodied word the Son, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who, if we want to know who this uh, Lord is, who this Son is, who this Jesus Christ is, the writer of Hebrews minces no words and says that to see Jesus is to see God. This is not two distinct beings. This is not one subservient, lesser kind of being to a higher kind of being. That there is absolute equality and synonymous character and nature. It says that he's the heir of all things. He's the one through whom all things were created. He is the very radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. To see Jesus is to see God. And he is the one who is powerful to uphold the universe merely by his word. I mean, think of the power of that, that by the word of Jesus, all things are and not only that, not only his character and his power and his glory, but the significance of his achievement. After making purification for sins, he dies for the sins of the world, sits at the right hand of majesty on high, the place of honor and power, and he is so much more superior than even the angels. Friends, this Jesus, though cute and cooing in a manger. We love to sing these wonderful songs about the beauty and the glory of ba the baby Jesus. And, and we love babies and how cute and, and how wonderful they smell and the softness of their skin and all that. But Jesus, though comes as a baby, is very God of God, light of light, 
Lord of Lords. So to see the baby in the manger is not just to be enamored at his cuteness, but we ought to be awed at his glory. May we be awed at the sufficiency of Christ. May the Lord be with you. I'll see you again tomorrow.